Hello, welcome to the Bitcoin game. I'm Rob Mitchell. I wanted to really have fun and celebrate this 10th episode. I decided to focus on something the entire cryptocurrency community loves to talk about, taxes. Okay, maybe not. But I actually had a lot more fun than I expected speaking to Jake Benson, CEO and founder of Libra Tax. This was my chance to ask every tax accounting question I could think of related to cryptocurrency. Before the interview, I also spent a little time with Libra Tax, and I wasn't sold it had the features I needed. But after getting a couple of tips from Jake on hidden capabilities and techniques, I now think I'll be using Libra Tax to help with my accounting this year. So if you think you might want to give Libra Tax a spin, you might find these tips helpful. While Jake certainly seems like a tax expert to me, please do not use this podcast for personal tax advice. Consult with a tax professional or do your own research to make sure you file your taxes correctly. There are certainly gray areas when it comes to tax regulation, especially with new financial technologies. So there's often an aggressive and a conservative approach. To libertarians, anarchists, and those not subject to U.S. tax law, I apologize that the content discussed may not be of any bearing to your lives. I didn't bury the magic word too deep this time, so give the episode a chance, and maybe you'll find the details more interesting than you expected. To accounting people, I apologize for continually mispronouncing FIFO as FIFO. As always, visit the show notes on letstalkbitcoin.com for links to the subjects discussed on this episode. Hi, Jake. Welcome to the Bitcoin game. Hey, Rob. As tax time rolls around here in the United States, I'm realizing how time-consuming my cryptocurrency tax accounting looks to be this year. I have a lot more transactions and currencies to deal with than I did the previous year. I figure there must be a lot of other people in the same boat, so it seemed like a great opportunity to invite you on the show. I'm hoping to talk to you about general accounting strategies for tax time that will help people attempt to lawfully comply with the U.S. tax regulations, and um, definitely want to talk to you about Libra Tax, which appears to be the premier cryptocurrency accounting software right now. Um, But before we get into talking about taxes and accounting, I wanted to learn a bit about you. When did you get into Bitcoin? It was um, in 2012 when I started watching it. Uh, It was just incredibly fascinating, of course. I think a lot of people got into it that way, um, you know, where they just started watching it and the more and more they thought about it and learned about it, um, people started to invest in it as the second step. So that was that was me watching it for about a year before I invested in it. Invested my first Bitcoin when it was around $60 before it shot up into, you know, that, that first bubble that a lot of us are aware with in the you know the 215 range or just above 200 and then it went through its crash and then the next bubble um so i've been through you know the last two major bitcoin bubbles as an investor seeing you know gains and subsequent losses and thinking about you know what my capital gains and losses would be um, is, is what prompted me to create libra tax Um, And I have a background in financial applications, um, IT consulting. So it was something that I saw an absence in the marketplace, um, something I knew I could do and and decided it was time to leave my previous job and and do the startup. And just out of curiosity, where did you buy your first Bitcoin? I bought my first Bitcoin on Coinbase. Coinbase. Okay. Yep. I'm just trying to think. Coinbase wasn't even on my radar. I, and I, was buying my first Bitcoin just around the time of that spike. And uh, I just had, you know, saw, oh, Mt. Gox has 80% or whatever of the volume. So I figured that must be the place to go. Yeah, I never actually did any trading uh, in the early days on on Mt. Gox. Um, I had a fishy feeling from them just in the beginning. It just seemed a little bit off to me. And I know I liked um, Coinbase's, you know, more... Uh, user friendly approach so so my first purchase is is when coinbase was just getting started and i felt comfortable buying it then got it i was going to say that must have been early days for coinbase um how did you feel comfortable with them at that point when they were pretty new actually because friends of friends <laughs> well that'll do it when, when you know the people operating it 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 does help a little bit for trust sure 
A year ago, I researched the guidelines for reporting cryptocurrency gains so I could calculate my own realized Bitcoin gains for 2013. I think I understand the basics, and that's that in the U.S., Bitcoin is property, and every time you sell, spend, or trade Bitcoin, it's a taxable event. And so the cost basis for every time you sell or spend any cryptocurrency, basically, you need to figure out the value at the time you purchased whatever, I guess, cost basis you're using and the value at the time you sell it or spend it. Does that all sound accurate? Yeah, that's the basics. The thing that surprises a lot of people, um, if, if they're not familiar with, with capital gains and, and the reporting of it, is that every time you spend Bitcoin, not just trade it, spending it is like trading it as far as reporting purposes go. doesn't matter how small the dollar amount is, any purchase using Bitcoin is a taxable event. And as you can imagine, that gets extremely cumbersome if you use it with any sort of frequency. And there's a couple of problems with that is uh, nobody's tracking the cost basis unless you're on an actual exchange doing the trading and you're trading it with USD, the exchange will have your USD cost basis. But in terms of just spending out of your wallet, there's no cost basis tracking. There's no holding period tracking. And that's another piece of information uh, that you technically need to know whether your gain or loss is a long term or a short term gain or loss. So that's just one more level of complexity. So there's no holding period tracking. There's no basis tracking. And that makes it nearly impossible. And I say virtually impossible as an individual to go back and recollect the price of Bitcoin every time you spent it. Just simply getting an aggregated picture of all your transaction history across multiple wallets can be a big challenge. So those are the specific things that our software addresses and automates so that instead of having this huge burden of remembering cost basis or even trying to look it up and figure it out, aggregating your transaction history, we do all that stuff in our software for you. And then once you're set up with it, it's actually keeping track of your transactions in real time, uh, can give you your gains and losses in real time. And then the big time saver is outputting the tax report that you can attach to your tax return or just hand it to your CPA and they'll know what to do. So what could be, you know, a several hour process or, you know, over the course of a few days, trying to pull together all of your trading history, and then not to mention applying a cost basis method, which is not easy even for CPAs to do because it's a lot of math involved. We do all the math for you. It only takes a few minutes, actually. So in 2013, I talked to my accountant. I had no idea. I've never calculated gains on things, you know. Most people haven't. <laughs> yeah, it was the first time I'd heard of first and first out. And do you just say FIFO? FIFO. FIFO, okay. So that helped me, I mean, his basic suggestion. And now, now this was nice for me because everything was 2013. I hadn't bought any Bitcoin before that. So there was no question. Everything was a short term capital gain. I, mean, I basically just saw how many Bitcoins I'd spent in any way. And then I tried to go back and find that same number of purchases that equated the same number of Bitcoins. And that would help me figure out the cost basis. And then I went and looked up what I spent for them, the value that they were worth when I spent them, and then got a gain in, in my case. Now I'm wondering that I've got this FIFO method set up from 2013. Can I switch to a different method for 2014? Yep. So this is one thing individuals should know is you can pick your own basis method each year. Now, as a business, you have to pick LIFO or FIFO and stick to it, uh, but individuals have a little bit more freedom. They can choose an accounting method each year, and as, as long as they're not doing so to create some kind of gap between each year, you still got to recognize all your gains, but you can switch to a different method in a later year. And oftentimes, depending on the method you use, you can dramatically change your reportable gains or losses. So yeah, to answer your question, uh, you can switch. And I guess I'll just go a little bit tangent here with that strategy. I mean, do you believe people were selling at the end of the year for tax losses? There's a set, a subset, probably the minority of investors that thought about loss harvesting uh, before the end of the year. I don't think it was uh, a major influence on the price. Um, I don't have any data to support that, really, but that's my thoughts. I don't think 
there was any significant um, impact on the price just because of loss harvesting. Today's magic word is Libra, L-I-B-R-A, as in the astrological sign or Libra tax. Use the magic word to claim your share of this week's listener distribution of LTB coin on letstalkbitcoin.com. I've given a gift of a funded Bitcoin paper wallet to various family members and friends. Can you explain how that's handled uh, in my tax calculation? Yeah, and this is just one more uh, complexity issue that um, if, if you weren't experienced with tax law, you'd just have no clue. Uh, so gifts are interesting in that when you gift property, and remember that the IRS defined Bitcoin as property, not currency. When you gift property, you are also transferring the cost basis and holding period to the recipient. So this is exactly how stocks work. Um, just like if you were to gift a share of stock, they are also inheriting the original cost basis. So your acquisition date and your original basis. So what that means is if you bought a Bitcoin at $100, you give it to somebody when it went up to $200. And then let's say that person sells it when it gets to $300. Well, within their holding period, their personal holding period, it went up $100. But since it was a gift from you originally and you paid $100 for it, they technically owe $200 worth of capital gains. That's an even additional layer of difficulty in, in trying to you know, track and properly report your Bitcoin activity. Technically, gifts of under $14,000, um, I don't know how many are giving larger gifts than that. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them are you know, change tips for you know, very small amounts. Technically, there's, there's no exception to that. So even tiny gifts of Bitcoin, the rule is, because this is just generic rules for property, this is nothing special for Bitcoin, this is just the way property transaction tax law works, is that basis is also transferred. Wow. <laughs> so that's <laughs> the, the reality of that versus the reality, I mean, I've definitely not given anyone a cost basis when I gave them a paper wallet, and I have to imagine very few people have, but... I mean, is anyone, any recipient of a Bitcoin gift going to be reporting this? Well, they have two options to try to find out the basis. Now, that's impossible if it's an anonymous gift, and especially if you're doing these tiny amounts like on change tip. You could always assume the basis was zero. Ah, okay. The effect of that would be treating it like income. So while it's not income, um, you can assume the basis of zero, and that's just a conservative assumption that'll let you stay compliant. And its, it's net effect is that it's basically it received as income. So they would benefit from knowing the basis because they'll ultimately report less gains on something that has a basis higher than zero. So it's not the worst thing in the world, but it does, you know, for things to be done perfectly and, and accountingly correct, yeah, there, there really isn't anybody sending basis information back and forth, especially not, you know, on stuff like Change Tip yet. But I've been talking with Change Tip, know that team really well, and we've just engaged in a partnership that'll allow users to to have that option so they're you know, operating compliantly, and if they opt in to uh, reporting basis, they should be able to. So uh, we have a solution for that, and fortunately, it's not something that the you know user has to think about at the time of transaction. You know, our software will just handle it in the background. So yeah, at face value, it sounds like just an impossible nightmare. Um, but the cool thing is, all these transactions are digital and or they're stored on the blockchain they can be tracked somehow it's just going to require specific custom software like the stuff i'm building to automate all these rules okay so now this might be insane to focus on this but i have so many questions now just <laughs> based on this one thing like <laughs> yeah if you received a uh, bitcoin from someone you don't report it until you sell that bitcoin or that's you correct so it's not income you don't have to report it on your income but when you dispose of it, so that could be a sale, or if you re-gift it, <laughs> which could certainly be the case. With property, there's only a taxable event upon disposal, not upon acquisition. 
unless it was earned income. Uh, gifts and things like tips back and forth, those are not considered income. So if I gave someone a Bitcoin when it was worth 1000 and they sold it at 200 could they claim a loss of $800? <laughs> no. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in the reverse. <laughs> okay. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Now, other things I realize, like if I transfer Bitcoin to a paper wallet, but I might give that paper wallet to someone a year, a month, whatever time later, yeah. it seems like a really murky point on, you know, someone like, oh, well, I see this in a blockchain says this date. And you go, oh, well, yeah. I mean, you can't say it was before that, but anytime after that, before the sale, I guess you could say that was the date. So my response to that is reporting is largely faith-based. When it comes to murky stuff like that, and this is the same with cash transactions, there's a ton of cash transactions that are reported on faith. When it comes to something, you know, that specific scenario you mentioned, you basically are expected to report that on, on faith. There may not be a record anywhere, neither on the blockchain or from any payment processor that an exchange happened, but the expectation is that you report it on faith. Okay. And I swear I'm almost done with this topic, but <laughs> if I gave someone a couch and for some reason someone discovered this couch was valuable and they sold it and the value was much more for some reason when they sold it, are you supposed to report that? Technically. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, when it comes to stuff like physical property, there's no paper trail. So it is rarely uncommon for those things to be reported. Unless you're a wealthy person, you've got an estate sale, and you've really got property of value that you know has been examined by auditors. But in history, there hasn't really been transactions of property on such a frequent and recorded basis. This concept of digital property really is not very familiar with people. So the rules still apply regardless of is it tangible property or intangible property. Okay. So now I think of giving a donation kind of like giving a gift. Does cost basis matter when you're giving a donation? No, not really. And this is the very cool thing about donations and part of the reason I'm working closely with BitGive because donations of property uh, have always been an extremely effective way to offset one's tax liability. And it doesn't even just have to offset capital gains. It can offset your actual standard income. And this is a, a neat feature of our software is that when you do decide to donate Bitcoin, it is in your best interest to donate the coins you have with the lowest basis. And therefore, you're eliminating the potential realized gain to a larger extent. And one of the features of our program is when you're donating Bitcoin, we automatically account for them such that you're donating your lowest basis coins. And uh, that's a huge part of our optimized accounting. And, and we do encourage the users to think about making donations because sometimes you can offset all of your gains or even get into offsetting some of your income. So this is potentially a way to make gains in Bitcoin, make a few donations at the same time to offset those gains, but then not owe the IRS on your gains. Um, and you can do that with donations. Assuming the price is appreciating now with you know the price depressed, you know, the opportunity is not as good if you've got coins with losses. But uh, nonetheless, you know, in, in traditional equity markets, there's, there's a big practice of donating appreciated stock to charity because it's, it's one of the best ways to help offset uh, your taxable liabilities. Just so I understand how it works, if, say, I bought a Bitcoin, well, we'll just say we're back in time. I bought a Bitcoin for $100 dollars. And I donate it when it was worth when it's worth a thousand dollars. What does that look like on my taxes? You write off a thousand dollars against your income, and you realize zero gains. So you write off the full amount of that appreciation, but you owe no taxes on that appreciation. Very interesting. So, aside from people feeling rich when Bitcoin is up, uh, there's an actual tax incentive to donate when when it's up. Absolutely. Yep. How do you calculate the tax basis of gifted Bitcoin? Is that FIFO or do you have to follow the actual trail of the exact Bitcoin you gave, which I guess seems unreasonable? It's, it's actually impossible. And this is 
something I'm I'm helping to educate people on is when when Bitcoin enters a wallet, it's it's kind of like a liquid. You can track where it's come from to a certain extent, but it's which Bitcoins are leaving your wallet is not always exactly clear. So in the absence of an actual identifying value on Bitcoin, we have identifiers for wallets and transactions, um, but not necessarily at the granular level. So for an individual, they just apply a basis on their transactions in aggregate. There's nothing different about the basis methodology from gifts to sales and purchases or donations. It's all the same method uh, once you choose a method to use. If Bitcoin seems to mysteriously disappear from one of your wallets, what's the proper way to account for that? Do you need documentation to try to prove that something was stolen rather than spent? It's just an unfortunate loss. So uh, you don't really get to write off theft. You can say it was lost, but that's a different process and it's not a capital loss. So unfortunately, anything you lose, and this includes gambling too. If you've lost coin while you're gambling it on Satoshi Dice, that's not a capital loss um, that you get to use to offset gains. That's something a lot of people don't realize. Okay, so what about people uh, who, I guess, own, in theory, a ton of Bitcoin and say it's at a Mt. Gox and it, who knows what happened to it, but it's gone. Is that a loss you can claim? No, it's, it's theft. You may be able to talk to your CPA and figure out some kind of mechanism for calling it a loss, but for the most part, theft is not um, an offset to capital gains. So if I, say, had a Bitcoin that I believe was hacked and stolen from me, do I actually have to claim gains from when it was stolen? No, because you, did, you never disposed them. They were just lost. Okay. <laughs> so gain, gains are only reported when they are recognized or realized and that's when they're in your possession you dispose of them and the gain is actually on the books i guess it'd be a similar situation say you know there's so many scams out here say you sent some bitcoin to get a product and or a coin or whatever and you never got that yep is that the same as yep it doesn't have to be reported as a sale so there's there's no realized gains there when you lose something Okay. So there can be things that, if you just looked at the blockchain, point to sales or different things, but from a tax perspective, accounting perspective, they might not actually be once you know the details, I guess. Mm -hmm. I did set up a Libra tax account, and I've tried importing CSVs from Coinbase and blockchain, and uh, also imported uh, from a Bitcoin address associated with a counterparty wallet, which uses Bitcoin in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. Have you been involved at all or paid much attention to metalayers like counterparty and how they use Bitcoin and doing accounting for those type of transactions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the evolution of our software will definitely be able to handle that stuff. For now, we're just you know, addressing the very basic usages. But yes, when you've got a coin with some other value attached to it, that should be reported as well. We don't have integration with their system yet, though so that's uh, it's on our roadmap so that we can handle, you know, all the different flavors of, of digital property. Some questions about Libra Tax. Is there a way that users can be really assured of privacy? Like, are there ties between user IP addresses and the accounts? Yeah, so here's our philosophy. On the internet, there's almost this trade off of uh, privacy and convenience. Uh, we don't really have a stance on that. Uh, we don't want to force any users to give over information they don't want to. So, if you want to maintain full anonymity, um, and I know that's, that's a prerogative for a lot of people in the industry, uh, your choice is to upload a spreadsheet with trading data, just dates and amounts. You don't even have to include your public addresses if you don't want to. As long as you can provide us with dates and amounts, um, we can do the calculation for you. Uh, you don't have to give us your personal email address. You can come up with a, a one-time use one to register with our software. We don't collect your location, name, nothing. So, yeah, we know a lot of people in this industry um, care about their privacy. So if you want to use the system purely as, as a fancy calculator, um, feel free to do so. 
now we have value add features you know for instance ability to hashtag your transactions add notes to them for tracking purposes name your public addresses so you're not looking at this string of hard to read text if if those are features that you want yeah it's it's a necessary sacrifice that those records are stored somewhere right um so it's really up to the user we haven't forced anybody to to include any detail into our service um, more detail than they have to so it's it's kind of an opt-in sort of thing um, if, if you like the value add features like uploading addresses and connecting directly to your wallet like coinbase you know the trading data does come over um, as part of those connections or you know you can extract your csv remove your public addresses and just upload dates and numbers so it's uh, it's a user's option is there any way to create a CSV file that's not set up? I, I see you guys can accept the outputs from Coinbase, Bitstamp, Blockchain.info, and Electrum. Yep. Uh, my like QT Core client, can that export? Or is that a totally different format? That Yeah, it can export. I mean, can you guys read it? <laughs> is what can we say. read it? Yeah, yeah, so only our posted formats uh, we can read. So we've... You know, put a lot of effort into trying to support different formats. The issue with that is oftentimes uh, those formats are changing. You know, this has happened with Coinbase. They updated the format of their reports, and then, you know, we have to go back, figure that out, and update our code. So um, it's not a feature yet, but what we're going to have is uh, like a, a smart upload feature for um, CSVs where you upload any CSV and then you pick the columns where the, where the date is and uh, where the notes field might be and where the amount and value is so that it's more of a universal upload system. So we can do our best to, to support the most popular wallet extracts, um, but it's a lot of resources to go and support every single one. So we chose the most popular ones and uh, pretty soon we'll have like a smart upload feature. Does it seem reasonable a user could maybe download a CSV file from one of the mentioned sources and then basically see the format and just kind of put their own data in there to try to do the same thing? Yeah, exactly. In, in the meantime, that's a very actually straightforward way to use our system universally. So you can still extract your information. Our Libra generic format is designed to be used for that purpose. So you can basically move the columns around, um, make sure the dates and amounts are formatted in the right way, and then you can upload anything. Oh, okay. So is there an example of that Libra-specific format that people can, can download, or how do I Oh, yeah, that? yeah, absolutely. So on the, yeah, yeah, in the import pop-up window, there's the supported formats link, and then you can download our template, and then you can just throw all of your data into that template. I watched your video that demonstrates Bitcoin altcoin trading pairs, mm -hmm. and I thought that was interesting. And I wasn't sure how the altcoin data is entered. Is that just all a manual entry? Yeah, it's 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 manual for now until we develop a uh, an integration with other types of blockchains. So right now uh, we're hooked up to to basically the blockchain of of Bitcoin and the blockchain of Ripple. And that's just to address, you know, obviously Bitcoin's the largest <laughs> cryptocurrency. Um, but we will, uh, going forward, have native support for more alt currencies. It's just not ready yet. So until then, yeah, it's, it's a manual process. And can that be done with the spreadsheet or just the entry at a time? Oh, oh absolutely. On the spreadsheet, there's just an extra column where you put in your, your three-digit, three-letter currency code. Got it. Okay. For anything that's not Bitcoin, it's not going to do an automatic uh, cost basis lookup because we don't have the uh, price databases for other all currencies. But if you provide the basis and you provide the currency code, it'll handle anything and still do the calculations just fine. Understood. Let's say you're trying to keep track of, let's talk Bitcoin you received and it's before it was traded at a, on an exchange how would someone just try to estimate the value at the time the LTV coin was uh, acquired? You can give your best guess, and let's face it, since reporting is largely faith-based anyway, um, and when it comes to filing taxes, if, if you have evidence that you're doing your best effort, you shouldn't have a problem. 
So either have some, some type of documentation that gives a fair estimate. Uh, if you've got any even math in an Excel spreadsheet, that, that's a reasonable estimate would be fine most likely. Or worst case, and, and the easiest thing to do is just assume a basis of zero. Ah, that of course, sure. I guess I'll mention too that I had problems with a Coinbase CSV file and I contacted uh, LibreTax support and I got a reply in well under 24 hours. And it turned out the way my Safari browser was downloading the file was messing it up. Mm -hmm. So just, just downloading from Chrome fixed the issue. But I did just want to say that for a free service, it was really great to get that kind of support. So I got to give you a nod on that. Thanks. We try. We try. I mean, it's tax season is such a tough thing already. Um, and it's, it's even harder for, for people in Bitcoin. So, you know, I would wish that's not the case. And I see long term because digital currencies are digital. This should be as simple as clicking a button every single year. And all this stuff is done automatically. Uh, we're not there yet, but you know, we're progressing there. Sure, and I think it, it makes sense that at some point this will just be a breeze. It's just not not yet. You won't even have to think about it, you know, in the long run, yep. I'm just curious, so with that good feedback I got really quickly, how big is your team? Uh, we have a team of six, development team of three, me, the CFO, and our social networking, marketing, and growth person. So team of six right now. And is everyone located in the Bay Area? Nope. Um, me and technical lead are, uh, and marketing are, um, and then we're somewhat distributed. And are you self-funded or is there some funding involved with your business? Yeah, we have been funded. Our original funding came from an accelerator called Crosscoin Ventures. Uh, they were loosely associated with Ripple Labs. So we were originally funded in $50,000 worth of XRP. So that's, that's an interesting and actually the first case of a company being funded with XRP. We were their first accelerated company. Um, so that was a very cool experience. Uh, I got to work out of Ripple Labs for a good period of time. And we were able to use that money, build an MVP, grow the team just a little bit, and we went out to do an angel round and raised another $550,000, um, and our lead was Liberty City Ventures, uh, also investors of, of the New York exchange ItBit. So we have raised uh, just, just over half a million so far and looking to do another growth round here fairly soon because we're starting to get a uh, pretty big uptick and, and we're doing a good job of trying to own the industry so far. So yeah, we really don't have any other true competition yet. So you said MVP minimum, Min minimum viable product. God, I couldn't, <laughs> I've heard that before. I could not remember. So you must really have a, a big long-term roadmap. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I see digital currency, um, and even bigger picture digital properties, you know, uh, things like deeds and titles being exchanged in digital format across the internet. And as that practice expands and we start to see a lot more digital transactions of, of property, not just currency, um, there's a lot of accounting that needs to take place. So we kind of want to be at the backbone of all of that stuff as, you know, everybody's imagination comes to play here and we're starting to see the digital transfer of all kinds of different things. There's always going to be some sort of taxable event when property exchanges hands from one party to another. You know, even if it's, it's these distributed autonomous organizations that are exchanging property and value, you know, there will probably be taxable implications to those sort of things. And that's all breaking new ground. There's not really any software yet that that addresses these future, you know, imaginary transactions now, but they're they're going to start happening um, sooner or later. So, yeah, that's my long term goal is is to be uh, the accounting platform behind the digital transfer of value over the Internet. The Internet of value needs <laughs> an accountant. So that's what we want to be uh, long term. Now, here in the short term, we're going to release Libra Business and Libra Pro. So we have Libra Tax, that's for individuals. Libra Business 
is going to be uh, tailored towards merchants, any business with Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Um, so we'll have monthly reconciliation and some features that you know are uh, more attractive to a business there, QuickBooks integration, thing like that. Um, and then Libra Pro, which is going to be for CPAs and tax preparers, accounting firms who have clients with digital currencies on the balance sheet. So we'll have a full product suite here in the next couple of weeks, um, rolling into the middle of tax season. Interesting, interesting. I'm honestly kind of surprised that there aren't more companies like yours existing yet. Like a year ago, I thought, well, this is tough, but I'm sure there'll be a lot more people doing what you're doing by this time. And I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I expected more competition too. Um, now, my explanation for that, I don't know if it's true or not, um, but there's, there's a very rare overlap between you know, bleeding edge technology and conservative, you know, traditional accounting. You're not going to find um, a lot of people with tax and accounting experience and, you know, app development and, and high tech. They're almost polar opposites. So I was in a unique situation where I was doing, you know, enterprise grade implementations between SAP and ADP and some of these multi-million dollar integrations. Um, and, and payroll tax is a million times more complicated than capital gains tax could ever be. So I, I think my my overlap of experience between you know, high tech and, and accounting and, and tax law is actually kind of unique. <laughs> so I'm trying to think, I mean, this again, just another opinion on your part, but what percentage of people in the U.S. who've traded Bitcoin in 2014 will make an attempt to accurately file for their Bitcoin gains or losses? Oh, 100%, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, my real insight is I think this year, um, probably much less than half. Uh, that's, that's my intuition. I think we still have a large part of the community that carries a lot of weight in their um, anti-establishment values. So until the space you know, really starts maturing. And, and it is going in that direction. We are getting maturity. Um, but I still think there's a fair share of, you know, the very early adopters or the people who adopted this for their ethical reasons. That sector, I, I don't necessarily expect to, to uh, do their filing. So my, my rough guess is less than half. Um, but as we see things mature, and especially if we see somebody get audited, you know, the IRS doesn't have the resources to go and audit everybody, but, you know, a strategy they could easily use is to pick a uh, high profile person in the industry, choose to audit them, and that could scare a lot of people into filing. Now, one thing I want to mention is, you know, anybody who's bought Bitcoin through an exchange like Coinbase, where they're already KYC AML, those individuals, I, I think, might want to think seriously about doing their tax filing properly because they're already on record as having Bitcoin. So if you sold Bitcoin, say, through Coinbase, should you expect some kind of a 1099 or something from them? No, um, 1099s are not required for digital currency. That is a requirement just for stocks and equities. There is no requirement for 1099 reporting, though I completely believe uh, a report should be given to users anyways. And I've, um, I've been talking with Coinbase uh, about that specifically is delivering some type of basis reporting export that serves the same purpose. Uh, and even though it's not required by the government, it's still considered standard for brokerages and exchanges to issue what they're proceeds would be. Now that's difficult for an exchange to do because they see a lot of outside coins coming in. So any uh, gain or loss calculations they could try to make aren't really necessarily or provably accurate. So despite not needing a 1099, I still think there should be an industry standard for delivering uh, a basis report to their users. And one of the things I want to do here shortly is propose an industry standard for exchanges and payment processors to, to deliver users a, a standard format just so that it's easier for them and, and they'll have 
you know, to do all this manual work. Every answer you tell me brings up five more questions. <laughs> <laughs> is is Coinbase required, or do you believe that they voluntarily issue to the government uh, reports about sales at least? Well, in the form of income, they're a business, right? So yeah. Um, but that might not be linked to specific users, though. Oh, when it comes to users, no. I, I'm not aware of any requirement or anything like that. I've heard people say, now that they have losses, that, oh, well, I don't have to worry about taxes in Bitcoin now. A lot of people might not realize that you can write your capital losses off against income. So if you have losses and you're not filing your return, you're, you're losing out. So it can be financially beneficial to report your losses. Actually, you can claim and write off up to 3000 a year. And even if you have more, it'll roll over two years after that. So it's important, or if, if, if you don't want to lose out on that opportunity for you know $3,000 write-off, you should file. Like everything you've said, now I have five more questions. <laughs> um, if you had a loss, do you still legally have to show this, or are you okay just not reporting it at all? You need to report it technically. I've, I've never heard of a case where somebody got in trouble for not reporting losses. But here's the thing. If you're reporting Bitcoin activity in a later year, you don't want to be having to retroactively look back at your transactions prior. Because if all of a sudden, and let's say for tax year 2015 next year, you're reporting gains, but you don't have any activity from 2014, that's going to that's gonna throw up a red flag. So regardless of gains or losses, seriously, the best practice is to just get them filed so you don't have to deal with bigger issues later. Do you need to report a Bitcoin address with your reports? No. Not at all. So the only pieces of information the IRS requires is the type of property. So you just say mm, 0.1 Bitcoin, uh, the date. You acquired it, the date you sold it, what you bought it for, what you sold it for, and then the difference between those, that's a realized gain or loss. And if people are using altcoins and different kinds of middle layer coins like counterparty tokens, each one needs to be segregated in a separate gain or loss? Yep, that's right. What type of penalties would someone who hasn't you know, declared any uh, income, I guess, from gains in cryptocurrencies, what kind of penalty could they expect if the government were to audit them and come down on them? If the government wants to say they're avoiding taxes, um, knowingly avoiding taxes, that's uh, tax fraud. So, <laughs> what, what I mean, can you go to jail for for that? Yeah, you know, uh, avoiding um, and knowingly excluding income or gains from from your tax uh, return is not something you want to deal with. Okay, so I'm going down this paranoid road then. So the government has not made Bitcoin illegal. They do have this very difficult, at least right now, method we're all supposed to report. And obviously, libertarians and people, uh, you know, anarchists, anyone kind of that leaning, has no interest in giving money to the government. And, uh, you know, some might think, oh, that's they're not paying their fair share, but a lot of people ethically don't support, you know, wars and different things the government's involved in. So I guess my paranoid thought is that, man, the government might have a lot of cases against a lot of people involved in cryptocurrency. You can see where I'm going with this. I mean, yeah. do you think there's any reason to just think like the government's just getting ready to get people? I mean, I have no reason to believe that. No. Okay. <laughs> That's paranoid. Not at all. Here's, here's the bottom line. Our arrests, and this is a funny thing I like to tell people, people generalize when they say they, they don't like the government, um, but the IRS also doesn't like our government. The IRS has been losing uh, a lot of their budget over the past few years, and they publicly complain about uh, the inability to do proper audits and a uh, lack of funding. So <laughs> the IRS is already very constrained when it comes to auditing, especially this year. Now, I don't want to say that to people so that they think the risk is lower, um, but there's no way the IRS's top priority is to go slap in the hands of Bitcoiners. They have much bigger fish to fry. I mean, if, if you were to add up all the gains in, in Bitcoin over the last couple of years, there's individual 
cases of fraud that amount to more than that, you know, with businesses um, and, and high net worth individuals. So it is just, I, I can't imagine it's even close to one of their priorities. I saw your software can do first in, first out, last in, first out, and another method which you say will give the most favorable tax consequences. So this got me researching because I I didn't know there were options at all. I just always thought it was first in, first out, and that was it. Um, Is your third method similar to what I saw is called specific shares method? Yeah, specific identification. So we call it Lever Tax Optimized. That's just our branding for it. But individuals are allowed to identify the specific shares and lots of property that they are selling. They don't necessarily have to follow a first in, first out, or last in, first out methodology. Knowing that, there's the potential to, at every disposable event, dispose the the optimal coin. So for selling, you would be financially benefited by selling your highest basis coins at all times. Because you can imagine your highest basis, that will result in in the lowest gain or the largest loss. Now, when you're gifting and donating, you always want to gift or donate the lowest basis coins. So this is just programmed into our software, and you can see a dramatic difference in most situations by switching from one of the standard methods to the optimized method. I've even seen people go from reporting a gain to reporting a loss. So it's, it can be very, very effective. Um, and I think that's one of the, the neatest features of our software is that optimization option. So while the IRS recommends FIFO, um, there's no guidance yet that any method is required. So until then, selective identification um, should work. So if I have the two totally separate accounts, say, I don't know, one on blockchain and one on my own uh, client, can I choose from either one for any transaction or do they have to at least be separated into the two separate uh, accounts, I guess I'd say? Since that's you know, kind of a unique issue to Bitcoin, um, and there's a concept when it comes to stocks and equities of tax lot IDs, so you could distinguish from one stock to another, so that it gets into fungibility. Um, for tax purposes, stocks and equities are really not fungible. Because there's no tracking system like a tax lot ID for Bitcoin, you can assume everything in your ownership is in the same bucket. If, if each different wallet you know, is like a different glass um, or a different bucket, it uh, doesn't necessarily matter come reporting time. Think of it all is in one bucket. Uh, and that's kind of the reason actually why you need to aggregate all your transactions into a single chronological place for accounting purposes. That's not intuitive to me that that would be allowed. Is there some, what is the background that says you can do that? There is not. That's one of those things where there's no guidance on this. It's, it's just a totally new concept. So um, there, there is no guidance on that. Would someone very conservative maybe say your stance is a stretch that, you know, no, this, this wallet on your computer is not linked with this, you know, uh, blockchain wallet. So how can you just say it's all the same? Right. So in that case, um, it, it's the individual's choice. If they want to stay conservative, just use FIFO or LIFO. Here's how it would work. Let's say, you know, a year or two from now, the IRS guidance comes out and says, no, nah, you got to use FIFO. Well, in that case, all you have to do is come back to the software click the drop down, click FIFO, and then submit your amended gains and losses. So until then, there's, in the absence of guidance, there's not really a risk unless there's a retroactive guidance in the future. And in that case, it's just a matter of reprocessing. But yes, if, if you want to take the conservative approach, uh, FIFO or LIFO are standards and you can't go wrong with those. Okay. Let's say I did use your kind of advantaged way of figuring out the cost basis and then say I wanted to use my own accounting software the next year or something else pops up, how would I know which purchases you used and which were still part of my you know, unused cost basis bitcoins? <laughs> you follow my uh, question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So that, that would be a very hard challenge. There would probably need to be an interface um, between our software and theirs. Um, we... 
are working on the ability to extract like a closing position of of all of your activities. So kind of a similar feature, just closing the books. And, and here's the lots which are left. That feature's not present right now, um, but that's something we know we need to build. So once I'm all done and I've entered everything, what type of data? I mean, I saw you could pay a fee for a specific tax form. Is there a way to, to export everything or is it basically just you get either bottom line gains or a tax form? So what you get is a report in the exact format of form 8949, uh, which is a, a sub form of Schedule D. And this provides the exact layout. All you have to do, it, the IRS doesn't require you literally fill in that form. If you attach a spreadsheet, physically staple it, for instance, or if you're e-filing, provide that attachment, um, the data is really all they need. So that is your last thing in, in filing your Bitcoin taxes is to just provide the IRS that exact report. Is that just a bottom line number or does it list all the transactions? It's a list of every single disposal and it's line item gain or loss. The 8949 report is a transaction level detail report and Schedule D is a uh, summary total. So at the very bottom of our report is your Schedule D summary, which is your net gains or losses, your net proceeds and your net basis. But in addition to that is the line item realized gains and losses. So uh, both are provided on the same report. If the IRS is listening, this is not me, but say someone (laughs) was told by their accountant they just needed the gains and not all the transactions. Does that mean something wasn't done correctly? So I know there are CPAs who skip that piece. Um, because they personally never had an issue with just reporting net gains. I don't think that's good practice. And, and here's the reason why is because this 8949 line item detail thing is a relatively new requirement. I, I think it's in 2012 when they actually separated the Schedule D uh, from 8949 and required that you have this line item detail. One of the IRS's evolving uh, requirements is cost basis reporting, um, not just for generic property, but derivatives and all sorts of different financial instruments are now uh, required to report basis on those. So that's kind of the the purpose of 8949 is to report basis on on property other than stocks and equities, which have tax lot IDs. So it may be the case that uh, your CPA has just done the net summary total on Schedule D for many years and hasn't had an issue with with not reporting the line item detail. And that may be the case, but technically, you are required to list the line item detail. Well, Jake, I've just decided I'm going to market this as must-listen material for any CPA who wants to deal with Bitcoin. <laughs> I find it fascinating. Yeah, you know, quite often tax and accounting can be the dullest topic. But now that it's kind of bumping up against like this new technology, I mean, I consider it its own financial asset class. I mean, I wouldn't expect there to be, you know, a new instrument in the IRS's tax law for like 10 years maybe. I mean, it took them 15 years to issue guidance um, and and create new laws around just derivatives. So I wouldn't expect that we get some type of special treatment for digital currencies anytime soon. Um, But the fact that, you know, this already uh, existing property tax law, which has been around for many, many years, applies to this brand new thing. I think it totally is fascinating too. <laughs> it's fun to run into somebody that, that thinks it's interesting too, because a lot of times it falls on deaf ears. What percentage of, of CPAs in the United States do you think have the slightest accounting understanding of how to deal with Bitcoin or have, have spent any time on it? it it's very few. And I'm pretty sure I know all of them. (laughs) And I can count them on about two hands. So this is actually, though, um, a big opportunity for me and and kind of one of my next biggest 
priorities is to start educating the accounting community. And just as a factor of legitimization for the entire field of digital currency is that the accounting practice has to get comfortable with this stuff. That's why I launched the Future of Money video series. Um, So we're actually interviewing all those accountants who are operating with digital currency right now. Um, We have two of those published. Our first one is a guy named Jason Tyra, one of the very first accountants to build his almost his entire practice around servicing digital currency clients. When Libra Pro comes out, this is basically the tool that I imagine the accounting industry using to get comfortable with digital currency. So instead of going to H&R Block or going to your accountant you've been working with for many years and they either want to turn you down or they just frown about it, they're not comfortable with it, we're bundling DCC certified educational material with Libra Pro. So accountants will now have the software to deal with digital currency and then um, the education too. So I'm going to accounting conferences and, and doing some other stuff in this area. What is DCC certified? What does that mean? DCC certified. Um, this is a company in New York that's providing courses for lawyers, financial professionals, and accounting professionals on understanding digital currency. Um, and after completing their coursework, they get a DCC certification. So we're bundling their accounting educational material uh, with our Libra Pro product. That's a cool, if you don't know about those guys, um, they're building a, a big network of professionals that are getting comfortable with digital currency. Okay, I see the abbreviation now. <laughs> Where can someone find these videos you were talking about, uh, the future of money videos? Right on our website, um, our link right now uh, links to Jason Tyra's interview, but we have a YouTube channel where every Monday we're going to publish a new interview with a financial professional, whether they're an accountant or a lawyer, ones who have experiences with clients with digital currency um, so other professionals can learn from them and follow suit. Boy, specializing in this part of Bitcoin, the, the compliance, the tax angle, I mean, it's seems like is really promising, I assume. It's one of those things that's not really sexy, but it is absolutely necessary. So, yeah. How long till the IRS has a whole cryptocurrency department who understands it, who sleuths <laughs> the blockchain to, to try to catch <laughs> crypto th- cheats? And- you know, um, they've already mentioned they've got a, a small team of people investigating uh, cryptocurrency activity. So it's on their radar, no doubt. I'm just thinking with all that data, boy, that's uh, <laughs> unlike anything else. I think the blockchain is going to, you know, what else could you ask for as far as once they have the tools that really help yeah, them? Ig- exactly. So, I mean, rather than being this tool for anonymity, I see a larger purpose for it in being a trackable record and, and for auditing and even tax purposes, as long as you've got nothing to hide, the potential for you know direct insight um, for auditing and compliance purposes. Now that's exciting, and you can start to imagine you know if every transaction was on a blockchain or some type of public ledger that that was a digital you know had digital public access as well, the entire practice of auditing wouldn't really need to exist. So the amount of money spent on auditing and bookkeeping uh, is tremendous. It's it's an entire industry. It's an entire profession. Um, It's got, you know, many different degrees you can follow just for these purposes. But I can see, you know, not not in the next 10 years, but as as we realize more and more what what a blockchain can do is going to really – save a lot of money, which is normally considered just uh, a cost center for businesses. They have to audit. They have to keep their books straight. Those are just burdens on, on business and the economy. Now, if those things become automated, to me, that's, that's where you start to see something like the blockchain be as big of an economic impact as something like the railroad. You're, you're relieving a business from a ton of overhead. That's what I'm more excited about. I like the the compliance stuff and saving businesses money and time. I guess now let me get into my personal situation with trying to use Libra Tax, and maybe other people have a similar situation. So sure. think of it as a as a general question. So uh-huh. 
for 2013, you know, I'd say I bought Bitcoin on Mt. Gox and uh, Coinbase. I did FIFO method and, you know, crossed off up to purchases to a certain point in time, which equaled the amount of Bitcoin I had spent during the year. Uh -huh. And so now my starting point basically is it's probably mid some purchase of Bitcoin. And I'm just trying to think of how do I jump into LibreTax? If, if everything was on Coinbase and things you support, then it would be a no brainer. But I mean, should I just manually enter all my purchases that aren't part of the systems you provide? Yeah, if we don't have the uh, direct integration for it, you're best off putting that into our generic CSV template and then uploading it that way. Okay, and I know I did say from Mt. Gox download CSV files, so hopefully I could just have quick copying and pasting. Yeah. One complication for me is after I enter a few accounts, they all seem consolidated, and I'm like, oh, if I could just look at my uh, coin Coinbase or, or blockchain yeah. things, that would help me kind of because that's how I've kept track of things. But everything gets consolidated, and then I'm like, oh, is there any way to differentiate these different sources that all are in now the Libra tax? There is a way to do this effectively um, before we build that feature. So upon each import, you could... Uh, use the check all button, and when you do the check all, you should be able to make a, a mass edit and then just add one of those hashtags to all those transactions. Or uh, if you're uploading a CSV, put a little hashtag on the note field, and then you'll be able to filter by that particular tag. That's a really great tip. I hadn't thought or realized you could do that, so that, that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. If I were to import, uh, or whatever your terminology is, uh, to have it read uh, a specific public address, mm -hmm. once it imports it, it lists just those transactions, and that's the point I could add something to all the all of those transactions. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so each time you import, you see just those files before they all, you see all the transactions, I should say. So on CSV upload, you're going to be able to put that hashtag there. For now, yeah, the... Address upload, you probably would have a hard time adding a particular tag to all those. Uh, besides the fact that that address is its own unique identifier. So it's, it's actually, it's still pretty easy to do. If you give that address a name or even just search on that address itself, all that address's transactions will be filtered. For some reason, when I was looking at LibreTax, I wasn't seeing something to help me identify just an address. It's not apparent, but if you put that address in the search field, it will filter only those transactions. Got it. But you have no idea. These little tips, <laughs> you should add these tips somewhere. Yes, I'm going to add another demo video to show you all these, these tricks to, to help you manage your transactions. Yeah, just these tricks are really making me lean more toward really trying to do this on LibreTax. So that's, that's great. Boy, it would be nice if you guys added another column to sort by and stuff. That would be great. Yeah, we you should see our okay. list of features <laughs> that, that we want to build. I mean, there's a long list, and I know there's ways to enhance the features. You know, but with limited resources, you gotta pick things based on raw functionality. So what we've done is get a very robust system, and you know, going forward, we're gonna have you know, a bunch more features. Um, you know, imagine graphing as well. You know, there's, there's a million things I want to do that, that'll make this very, very easy and, and more insightful. Um, okay. But, but yeah. So that's good to know. Okay, well, we should wrap this up. I really <laughs> appreciate all the time. And it really was fun for me. It was really informative. And hopefully there's enough people who want to know this stuff that this will be a popular episode to listen to. I hope so. I mean, people need to know it, whether, the, whether or not they want to. They need to know it. And I'm going to have my new accountant, you know, I'll send them this podcast and, you know, maybe everybody should. <laughs> I, I agree with you. <laughs> Are there any websites, uh, social media IDs or anything you'd like to plug? You can follow us on Twitter at Libra underscore tax. Uh, and you can follow our YouTube channel so that you have all our uh, software demos and you can watch the Future of Money video series. Okay. And that's LibraTax.com, I assume, right? Yep. That's our website. Well, thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to Episode 10 of The Bitcoin Game. 
There are a lot of very compelling Bitcoin podcasts out there, so I genuinely appreciate that you found time to listen to this one. Please let me know you listen by following or tweeting to The BTC Game on Twitter or commenting on this episode's page on letstalkbitcoin.com. You can find a listing of all the Bitcoin Game episodes by going to thebitcoingame.com. I'll be attending the Texas Bitcoin Conference. If you'll be there too, hope you'll find a way to say hello to me. Oh, and I was thinking, if I ever get to 100 episodes, maybe I should celebrate that one with something special too. Maybe we should focus on a fun subject like death. Yeah.